Good morning. It is good to be with you. I want to reiterate what I said last night, that as a family, we're grateful to you all. It's been a very enjoyable conference, most encouraging for us, and we thank you for the many kindnesses that you've extended to us. Now, my son wanted to help me up the stairs here, but I, I went for Naomi simply because I outweigh my son by 100 pounds, and uh, I thought that could come to grief. Now, someday, someday he'll be bigger than I am, Lord willing, but uh, I'm thankful for my wife to help me up uh, in the meantime. Let's turn in God's word to the book of Ruth once more, Ruth chapter 3 this time, Ruth chapter 3 and verse 17. Ruth chapter 3 and verse 17. Ruth 3 and verse 17, reading in God's word, it says, And she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. That's another one of my favorite verses in the book of Ruth. Because it speaks about the continuance of the ministry of Boaz. That he's not going to stop until he can declare mission accomplished. Now we've seen people, and I'm hesitant to say it here in Dallas, you know, with the presidential library at SMU and so forth. But we've heard people say, like our former president some years ago, mission accomplished. But unfortunately, the mission wasn't completely accomplished. You know, the war kind of went on, and it goes on today. And we have military forces around the world trying to deal with terrorism and with the various problems that go on. So we're tremendously sympathetic to our world leaders as they try to cope with the problems of our world. But when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, our heavenly Boaz, our kinsman redeemer, as we saw him to be last night, he is really someone who could say, it is finished. And when it comes to the redemptive payment that he made on the cross, when it comes to dealing with our sin, the Lord Jesus has finished it. We sang it this morning. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. The beautiful thing is that much like Naomi and Ruth, we can come to the Lord Jesus and we can find security. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi saying to Ruth, shall I not find security for you, my daughter? Or the Hebrew says there, shall I not find rest for you, my daughter? And when we think about our deep need, our soul's need of peace with God, The only way to peace with God is to have something done about our sin, to have sin taken out of the way, because sin has estranged us from God. It has alienated us from the life of God. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sins. But through the Lord Jesus, because he died to take away sin, because he died to destroy the works of the devil, because he rose again to prove that the sacrifice was accepted and the work was complete, we can be reconciled to God today. We can say, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, as Romans 5.1 says. I hope you have that today. I hope today you're resting. You know, every other belief system, every other worldview, every other religion in the world will tell you, you've got to do a bit more. You've got to try a bit harder. You've got to add something. You never know if you've got it right. There's more sacrifices, other pilgrimages, other shrines to visit. You've got to bathe in the Ganges or whatever it may be. There's always something more you have to do. It's only our heavenly Boaz, the Lord Jesus Christ, in him truly is strength. He says to us, come and rest in me. He says, come unto me. All ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a wonderful thing it is to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. To say, he's done the work that saves. Done is the work that saves. Once and forever done, the hymn says. Finish the righteousness 
that clothed the unrighteous one. I'm accepted this morning in the presence of God. I'm accepted in his sight, not because of who I am and what I've done. I'm accepted because the Lord Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. I'm accepted in his acceptability. I've been given the righteousness of God by faith. Not my righteousness, but that righteousness that God gives to those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that's what you have today too. I hope that you can rest in the Lord today and say whatever other cares come into my life, whatever other problems I can say with the hymn writer, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. I hope you're resting in him today. Well, Naomi said to Ruth, sit still, my daughter. You've done what you could. What did Ruth do? Well, she brought her need. She brought her indebtedness. In fact, not only her own, she actually brought Naomi's indebtedness. Because Ruth hadn't lost the inheritance, remember? Ruth never had the inheritance. She was a stranger. We heard it again this morning in the Lord's Supper. Why would you show favor on me? I'm a foreigner. I'm a stranger from the covenants of promise, as Ephesians 2 would say. I didn't have the inheritance. Naomi had it. But now I'm hooked up to Naomi. I, I said about her in chapter 1, Ruth could say, entreat me not to leave you. I'll go where you go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. So now her need is my need as well. I need that kinsman redeemer to come and restore the inheritance. And what's more, since this was my husband's, since this pertained to Malon as well, I need his name to be raised up in Israel. Because when God begins a work, he doesn't leave it half finished. He doesn't fail. Another hymn says, the work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yea and amen, and never was forfeited yet, forfeited yet. Yes, I to the end shall endure, as sure as the earnest is given, more happy, but not more secure, the souls of the blessed in heaven. That's the security of the believer, knowing that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it under the day of Christ Jesus. What day is that? It's the day that Romans 8 calls the day of redemption. The redemption not for the guilt of sin, not for the penalty we deserved. He paid that on the cross of Calvary. He'll never have to offer that again. Hebrews says it was once for all. But the redemption of the body is when he comes to pick up what he's purchased. See, it happens that way sometimes, doesn't it? You get your bonus at work, and you say, oh, <laughs> I've got the bonus, now I can buy that Lamborghini I've always wanted. Well, I don't know if you've wanted the Lamborghini, but I've wanted it for your sake, dear brother. Uh, yes, yeah, so you say, now I can buy the Lamborghini. <laughs> the only problem is, you know, I live down on the Rio Grande, far away from any Lamborghini dealer. So what do you do? Well, this is the 21st century, so happily for you, you can wire the money to the dealership here in Dallas. I trust you have a Lamborghini dealership in Dallas. I mean, there's enough oil millionaires roaming around and cattle barons and whatnot. Somebody's got to have a market for Lamborghinis. They can't all drive Cadillacs, right? And so you say, I'll wire the money up to Dallas. Now, you haven't gotten the car yet. You haven't picked it up, but it's yours. The title is in your name. The money's been deposited in the manufacturer's account or in the dealer's account. And there, sitting right there waiting for you, is a shiny fire engine red Lamborghini with gold wing doors, just hypothetically speaking. Not like I've thought about this or anything, you know, in my dreams. But anyway. And then one day you come up. <laughs> Your cousin Jethro gives you a ride in his Pinto or whatever, and he brings you into the dealership lot, and you say, there it is. There's that fantastic piece of Italian engineering with hand-stitched leather seating. There's my Lamborghini. I'm here to pick it up. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ paid far more, far greater a price than anyone pays for a car in our world. Even 
cars that are rare and exceedingly expensive, cars that cost more than my house. The Lord Jesus paid a price such as the universe has never seen before. The very life of the Son of God, a life of infinite value, a life that was perfect and acceptable in the sight of his Father, a life that made God the Father say from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Lord Jesus laid down that life. Why? To purchase a bride for himself. And the Lord Jesus paid that price. And the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead. He's not in a tomb today. He's in the glory of heaven. But he doesn't want to remain there alone. He's going to come one day and he's going to receive us to himself. Having purchased us at such a cost, having paid so much, he will not rest until he has brought many sons to glory until he has brought us to heaven until as Ephesians 5 says he presents the church to himself like a bride without spot or blemish or any such thing the Lord Jesus will not stop until the work is completely finished until everything that the father has appointed is complete until we stand with him in glory Licking your life's little story, as Robert Murray McShane says. When I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart. Not till then, O Lord, shall I know all to thee how much I owe. Indeed, we owe a great debt. A debt that is far beyond even the aggregate sum total of our united worth. Even all of the billions of people who've ever lived and all of the believers of all the ages and all the dispensations right up to the time the Lord closes the history of this earth. You could take the value of us all combined and it still doesn't equal the price given for us. And yet history is that story that the Lord is bringing back that which was lost. That the backslider, the prodigal, as we heard from the opening message of this conference, is being brought back. That Naomi will be brought back. That the one who is empty shall be filled full. She shall be made complete by the work of Boaz, by the work of this kinsman redeemer. Now the thing is, the real poignancy of this tale, and the worth and the energy, shall I say, of Boaz is brought home to us in chapter 4. Because Boaz goes to the gate of the city here. That was where business was done in the ancient world. It's also where government happened. That's why Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom in Genesis 19. That's why in 2 Samuel, Absalom was there by the gate, just ready to tell people when they came up, Oh, I would do better for you than this current administration. Sad that the administration was his dad. But he was saying, you know, I'd be a better king. And I I could take care of your case. You know, have you heard of judicial backlog? I mean, the courts are so filled with things. And you've got a good suit. I think, you know, I'd rule in your favor if only I were the king. Yes, the gate is the place where things like that happen. And here Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend. Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. Now, the background to this passage really is found in the 25s. You just got to put it in the right book. We've got Leviticus 25 that is going to tell us about the kinsman redeemer and buying back the land the inheritance that has been lost and restoring that to the person who has lost it. And then there's another chapter 25, Deuteronomy this time. That's about the Levirate marriage. Levirate being from the Latin for brother-in-law, the marriage of the brother-in-law. It never appealed to me when I was a single man, but the idea in the Bible was that if the oldest son passed away without raising up an heir, that the next marriageable son should marry that widow and the first son born from that union would be the heir of the dead brother. Because again, the Lord is concerned that not anybody be lost from the great work he's doing. 
Because it's not just about time and space. It's not just about the centuries and millennia that roll by. But there is a resurrection. And even in the Old Testament, saints like Job understood, the worms, the worms destroy this body. Yet in my flesh, I shall see God. They had that hope that there was something beyond the grave. They didn't understand it with the clarity that the later New Testament scriptures would give us because God's, God's word is progressive in its revelation. It tells us things little by little. And it's through the Lord Jesus, the New Testament says, that light and immortality have been brought to light through the gospel. So they understood there was something beyond. They didn't understand it with the clarity of what we had. But you can't help but read your Old Testament and notice that they were big on genealogies. Now, I know, that's not your favorite part. I mean, everybody would like to have their devotions in the Gospel of John, right? Or in Philippians or some such book like that. Or even in this Ruth. Uh-oh, <laughs> look out, spoiler alert. I hate to tell you this. There's a genealogy coming up. Yes, yes, at the end of the chapter even. Oh, no, a genealogy. You mean those long, very difficult names to pronounce? That's why I like you folks from Kerala. You've got great names. If I just shout out Thomas, I've covered about 25% of the people at the conference, you know? One way or the other. You don't know if I'm talking about your surname or your first name, but, you know, in theory, I, I might get it right. You know, you look at my name, it looks like Kieser, but it's pronounced Kaiser. I mean, I can't understand those Germans, but anyway, you know how it goes. But the genealogies in the Bible served an incredibly important function. They told us that history is going somewhere, that God has a plan, that there really aren't any nobodies to God, that there's no such thing as someone whose life doesn't signify, someone that God doesn't want to include, someone that God doesn't want to save and have a relationship with them. And you might feel like sometimes, my friend, in this world, like nobody cares about you, like you are a nobody as far as the world's concerned, like you're completely obscure. No one knows what you go through. But the Lord knows, you know. The Lord cares about you. The Lord has a plan for your life. It's to make you complete in Him. And that's the tragedy of people that reject the Lord because it's been possible in every dispensation, in every time period, it's been possible to reject the Lord. God gives us the freedom, just like I give my wife the freedom, I gave her the freedom in the first place to say no. I didn't come, as you know, maybe some people believe somewhere in the world they used to do this. You come and hit a woman over the head with a stick and you drag her off to your cave. I mean, that's really a caricature. I, I can't really find that in history, although the Spartans got pretty rough with their women. But I didn't hit my wife over the head and say, no, you must marry me. I didn't want an android wife either. You know, an android wife wouldn't be satisfied. I mean, sure, she could tell me, oh, I love you, honey. You're the best. But I'd be saying to myself, now that's just what Steve Jobs programmed her to say, you know? Or those fellows at Amazon or somewhere, wherever you got it from. Yeah, I could say, oh, I'm going to push this button and she's going to kiss me. Would I be satisfied with that? Now, I don't care if you can simulate the human lip and make it feel authentic. If I knew this was a non-sentient machine programmed to love me, that there was no genuine volition here, no true willingness, no desire for me, that wouldn't be satisfactory at all. And you know, the Lord is like that too. He woos us. He comes after us. He presents himself to us. And I want to tell you, the Bible presents him as the great lover because he's so beautiful. He's so good. He's altogether lovely. And he comes, and, and eventually the bride in Song of Solomon, she gets it right when she says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is towards me. Now, amazing, isn't it? We used to sing a chorus in our assembly. We haven't sung it lately for some reason, but the chorus went like this. Why should he love me so? 
Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior to Calvary go? Why should he love me so? And the Shunammite says, here's this guy who's so great. He's altogether lovely. From head to foot, he's absolutely gorgeous. He's strong. He defends me. He cares for me. He speaks to me tenderly. He has my desires in his heart. And he loves me. Why would he love me, she says. And we could say the same thing about the Lord Jesus. Why would he love us? But he does love us. Now, Boaz, as he comes to the gate, he recognizes that there was somebody in the family who was a closer relation, who could have been the kinsman redeemer. He was a closer kinsman. And initially, it sounded like he wanted to redeem him. When Boaz puts it down here that uh, Naomi has come back, he says in verse 3, from the country of Moab and sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there's no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. I don't know if there are any attorneys in the house, but that's essentially contractual, contractual, sorry, at this stage in the conference, it's hard to say words like that, contractual language. This is like a contract where now he's saying, you've got the right to redeem it. And when you're talking about adding to your land holdings, well, that sounded good to the fellow. I mean, after all, you know, he had one of those little farms down there in Texas. It was only 100 acres or so. I mean, that's nothing in Texas, right? You need some thousand acre thing even to get people to sort of look at it. No offense, Brother Ray, about your family and all that. But, you know, I'm just saying Texas is famous for these big, big spreads, right? So when you talk about real estate... This kinsman, he thought, well, that sounds pretty good. (laughs) Who wouldn't like more real estate? Even Lucy from Peanuts likes real estate. But anyway, real estate, yes, certainly. I'll buy that. Ah, but here comes Boaz in verse 5. On the day you buy the field from the land of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Hmm. Now, that's what you call one of those clauses that kind of gets you, you know? Like, oh, this was sounding like a good deal when it was just land. I mean, I can handle land. (laughs) But you're talking about getting married. Now, don't get me wrong, says the kinsman. Marriage is an honorable institution. I'm just not ready for an institution. (laughs) That's a joke. Anyway, never mind. Sorry. Double entendre with the word institution, of course. You know, like mental institution. But saw it on a t-shirt once. Sorry. Yeah. See, Boaz says it's not only getting the land back. There's the other matter of raising up an heir for Malon. You've got to marry his widow, which is Ruth the Moabitess. Now, The book of Ruth doesn't really spend a lot of time talking about what Ruth looked like physically. As far as I can tell, I don't know whether she was considered very beautiful or average looking or something less than that. It emphasizes much more her character, which I think we can definitely take a page out of the Bible on that one and say that's the key thing. That physical beauty Fine, we understand it. We understand how we are made, and especially men, how they're attracted by the eye. But the real key thing, the thing that you want to look for, guys, if you're not married, is character. Character, and especially godliness. It's what 1 Corinthians 7 calls being married in the Lord. And it goes the other way for women. That you want a guy, not just that can provide for you, but a a guy that loves the Lord. A guy that's going to be committed to his things. A guy that's going to lead the family in a way that pleases the Lord. That's really what you want. And as much as we've seen that Boaz takes care of Ruth, that Boaz gives to Ruth, that Boaz, through Ruth, takes care of Naomi as well, that he cares for them, he had a choice. He didn't have to desire Ruth. 
He didn't have to want her. He could be like this near kinsman that he says, a Moabitess? No, thank you. I mean, that's a stranger. That's a foreigner. Brother Ray was talking about that at the devotional this morning. No, thank you. That would mar my inheritance. <laughs> well then, says Boaz, all right then, I'm going to step in. You take off your shoe. That was the symbol. You take off your shoe that you're not going to do the right of the brother-in-law and you're not going to redeem her and I'm now going to do the other end of this deal where I'm going to buy what she has and so he goes on to tell them that he's going to acquire her verse 10 he says I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate you are witnesses this day now, here's a man who's not thinking just for himself. He doesn't have, and there are a few of you financial people about, I've talked to you. He's not just thinking about his own portfolio, okay? He's thinking about his responsibility to his people, specifically to his tribe. He's thinking about his responsibility to a family in the tribe, to Malan's family. And he could have said, well... It's tough about Malon and all, but after all, Elimelech is the one who decided to leave the inheritance. I mean, if they had just stayed put in Bethlehem, the Lord would have taken care of them, and they wouldn't have come to this impasse. All this trouble wouldn't have happened to them. But that's not how Boaz thinks. Boaz says, I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do, because I believe in God's inheritance. I believe that the Holy Land, and I think the only place the Bible actually uses that expression in the Old Testament, is in Zechariah 2. And it calls it His Holy Land. The land is the Lord's first and foremost. And the Lord shares it with the one He wants. Now, not just the land of Israel, not just a piece of territory about the size of the state of New Jersey in the Middle East that we know today. But Psalm 24 verse 1 tells us, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And what does the Lord do with his inheritance? I mean, the Lord, who has triumphed over sin, triumphed over death, triumphed over Satan, deposed him from his authority, he says, now is the judgment of the ruler of this world. And the cross puts paid to any kind of claim Satan had over this world or over mankind. The Lord says, I've totally taken that out of the way. I've liberated this world. And one day when I redeem my people, when I come to pick them up, you're going to know the glorious liberation of the sons of God. Freedom. Okay? Freedom. Freedom. That's what this world's going to know because it's the Lord's world. He's coming to rule over it as King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet when he comes to rule over it, what does he do? Well, Romans 8 also says that we are sons of God. A son not just being offspring, not just being a child in the family by nature, but a son has responsibility. A son bears likeness to the father. A son gets brought into the father's business dealings. He has responsibility over the holdings. Ultimately, the inheritance passes to the son. And he says, we are sons of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, we are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I tell you, that's far more extraordinary when you think about it than any Moabitess being brought from Moab to Israel. As long a journey as you think that is, and as great a thing as you think it is for Naomi to be empty and for this Gentile woman to become attached to her and the Lord to bring them into his land and make them full, as great as that is, that's nothing compared to what's coming for this world. That's just a picture of something far greater. Now, having said that, the wonderful thing is, not only that they get married, and we'd say today they live happily ever after, but you look at the benediction that comes from the people in the gate. They say, we are witnesses. The Lord, this is verse 11, the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. You know, today we have these websites about genealogies, and somebody can swab your 
I don't know, your cheek or something. I'm not sure exactly what they swab, but you can send that away to a company and they can tell you about your great uncle Mortimer who came from Utah or somewhere, or maybe you know you had a skeleton in the closet back in Andhra Pradesh or somewhere, I don't know. Anyway, they can tell you all about your ancestry and where everybody came from. And my problem is, I know enough about the scoundrels in my family and living memory that I'm not interested in digging too deeply. And when you go back here and they're blessing them and they're saying the Lord make you like Leah and Rachel. Ooh, part of me feels a little bit awkward. Because you remember when you read Genesis, I mean, you talk about dysfunctional family. That was a messed up situation. I mean, when you're turning up as the young bridegroom and you're expecting to marry Rachel and your dad, your father-in-law Laban, does the old bait and switch and you wake up with Leah the next morning, <laughs> surprise! I mean, that was kind of weird, right? And yet, he also gets Rachel and he works the seven years for each of them and, and then he further works for Laban for the flocks. But you look back at that and, hey, where were Leah and Rachel from in the first place? Well, they were Syrians. Oh, I see. So they weren't from the land either. They weren't from Abraham. I mean, I know they were a distant relation through his wife. But they weren't Hebrews in that sense. Till they joined with Jacob. And you look at that dysfunctional situation. And you look at how they have what I call the womb wars where they keep having babies and they keep saying, now I'm going to get one up on my sister, you know? Now I'm going to have another child. Now my husband will love me, Leah says. All this kind of thing. And with all that storm und drang, oh, sorry, that's not Mahalyam, that's German. Anyway, with all that storm and stress of what's happening in the family situation, what does God do? Well, he gives 12 sons and a daughter, and the 12 sons become the basis of the nation. Now you go back and you read about those sons and they didn't always behave very well. That brings us to verse number 12. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now I mentioned Joseph earlier in the weekend. Joseph was that model man. He was someone that you look at his life and the Lord has chosen not to record any of his sins for us. It's not that he was sinless. We know he was a sinner. But the Lord has not commemorated any of his sins or faults in the scripture, except maybe early on if you think he's a little bit too much bragging in chapter 37 or, or whatever. But anyway, Joseph is one of the most glorious pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ by all the positive things. Now, Joseph, you remember, gets sold into slavery. And in Genesis 39, there's a very enticing offer, the wife of his master, Potiphar, tries to seduce him. But he does not give in to that sin. Even though it costs him greatly, even though he's falsely accused of rape and ultimately imprisoned for that, imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit, Joseph maintains his integrity before the Lord and he maintains his testimony before men. And it's years before God puts that right and before God honors Joseph. Now, what was his older brother Judah doing during that time? Well, that's Genesis 38. Judah was, to borrow the words of a country song, since I'm in Texas, Judah was looking for love in all the wrong places. He was hanging out with another guy who didn't really share his values, and eventually he met a woman and fell in love and married her, and he had three sons. And so his sons came of age, and he decided to take a wife, Tamar, for his oldest son, Ur. Except Ur, well, he didn't really uh, do very well. It says he was evil and the Lord killed him. So then Judah says to Onan, son number two, I want you to go in and do the duty of the wife's brother. I want you to do what later Deuteronomy 25 codifies in the law, the Levirate law, that you're going to marry your sister-in-law and the child is going to be the heir of your dead brother. But Onan doesn't see anything in that for himself, and so he doesn't do it, and the Lord slays him as well. Which leaves a third son, Shelah. 
And uh, he's too young to get married right off, so the father makes some excuses. And as time goes by, when he is old enough to get married, Tamar notices that he's not given to her as husband. You see, this is a situation where somebody ought to be a godly man. Somebody ought to be faithful. Somebody ought to step up and marry Tamar and raise up a descendant to the dead brother. But they want to do it their way. They don't want to do it God's way. And so he doesn't do what he should. Judah doesn't give his son to Tamar because he's afraid that son will end up dead. And, of course, it's a very sordid and sad tale in chapter 38 that we won't go into publicly here. But you know that he goes out and he thinks he has a liaison with a woman of the night. And there's a child produced out of this. And actually, it's Tamar in disguise. Now, if you're going back through the family tree, are you going to want to highlight your ancestress who was with child by her father-in-law in such ignominious circumstances? Is that going to be something that you want people to know about? You're going to say, no, that's the, that's the skeleton of skeletons. You know, that's the family secret we don't ever talk about. And right here, it's at the end of the book of Ruth. Why? Well, it's part of the genealogy, after all, and, and it becomes part of our Lord's genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 as well. Why it's here is because God's pointing back and he's saying, you know what, even when man fails, even when human beings behave badly, even when they sin and corrupt themselves and do everything they ought not do, my grace is greater. My purposes are all wise. And I'm going to bring to pass what I purpose to do. So you've come to this point in history. And here's this woman who's a stranger, a foreigner, who you say has no right to come in. Well, listen, look back through the family tree. This is what I've been doing from the beginning, says God. I've not been building my work on people that are faithful and people that are perfect and people that always do it right because there aren't any such people, are there? I've been working in my grace to bring about my purposes through these people. And meanwhile, I've been training them because that's not the last story about Judah, thankfully. You remember that Judah, I think it's in Genesis 44, ends up being the one who, when they're standing in the courtroom in Egypt... And Zaphnath Paneah, the governor, is there. He's really Joseph incognito. And they don't recognize their brother. Because he's, you know, speaking in another tongue. He's talking in Telugu. And they're speaking Malayalam among themselves. Well, I know it was Egyptian and Hebrew, but bear with me. You know, and they don't know that he can understand what they're saying. And he sets up the situation where they can repeat history. They can sell their brother. They can give up their brother. And they can turn tail and go on their merry way and live their life and not care about their brother the same way they did with Joseph back in 37. They can do that again to Benjamin, the youngest brother. Are they going to do that again? Or has their heart changed toward the father? Has there been repentance? And it's Judah who stands up and says, Oh my Lord, please don't take the boy. Don't take Benjamin. Take me. Why do I want you to take me? Not just for Benjamin's sake, but it would kill my father. I just can't do that to him. You see, years before when he lost his other son, we rose up and we went through the pretense of comforting him. But I can't do this to dad again. Take me instead. I'll stand in the place of the guilty. I'll be surety for him. And Judah now learns what it is to be a substitute. And of course, Judah would one day have a descendant, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom Revelation 5 calls the lion of the tribe of Judah, the ultimate substitute, the one who dies in the place of sinners and says, I'll take the judgment that they deserve and I'll give them the righteousness that I deserve and I'll reconcile them to my father contingent, of course, on them repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's an extraordinary thing. Brother Ray shared with us this morning at the devotional in Romans chapter 9. I want to go over there a moment. He shared with us Romans chapter 9, where Romans 9 refers to a scripture from Hosea, 
that I referred to last night, but I referred to another New Testament passage that quotes it, 1 Peter 2. But we go back to Romans chapter 9 in the New Testament. And Romans chapter 9 reminds us of the favored position that we Gentiles are in because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Ruth is an excellent picture of this. Like Ruth, we were strangers. Like Ruth, we were far off. But he says here in Romans 9 and verse 25, as he also says in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of God. And then he goes on to talk about just a remnant of Israel uh, being saved, okay? But it's interesting, verse 29, he says, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Now remember Sodom and Gomorrah, we mentioned them earlier in the weekend because we said, where did Moab come from? Well, Moab was produced in the aftermath of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Moab and Ammon, these two idolatrous, unbelieving, pagan, Gentile nations came about through the failure of Lot and his daughters after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the Lord turns the tables in Isaiah and he says, now Israel, you think you're favored, you think you're close, you think you deserve salvation, you think you deserve all the benefits, you don't deserve it. If it wasn't for the grace and mercy of the Lord, you'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah too. Because you've also been great sinners against the Lord. You also deserve judgment. And it's only through grace that you are saved. Now it's interesting how the Lord talks about that. It is through uh, resurrection that this is going to happen. It's going to be a national resurrection for the nation. And we go ahead to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse 11. Talking about Israel, this all starts, by the way, because somebody asked Paul, all right, if Jesus is the Messiah, if you can say to a Jewish person in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, if Jesus is the Messiah, then why don't more Jews believe in him? Why aren't more Jews coming to faith in Jesus as the Christ? Why aren't they calling him Lord? So Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled? This is talking about Israel. Have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, did I say we were talking about Israel? That verse reminds me an awful lot of one particular Israelitess. Her name's Naomi. Her family had a great fall. We saw it in Ruth chapter 1, right? And God allowed them to go far away, allowed them to go out and depart from his ways and live in independence. And we've agreed, as Brother Babu Thomas showed us in his message yesterday, that this was sinful, this was wrong. But God allowed it to happen, and through it happening, what happened? Well, God in his sovereignty, even though Elimelech and his family weren't behaving as they should, and even though Naomi was hardly a stellar witness in chapter 1, God used that fall to bring salvation to the Gentiles, specifically the Gentile Ruth. We've been talking about them all by us. Now, watch this. Through their fall, the Gentiles, <laughs> they've been brought in. Now he says, verse 12, Now if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, in so much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if I may by any means provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And he goes on to talk in an agricultural metaphor about the Lord grafting in these wild branches, the Gentiles. Somebody who wasn't there to begin with. Somebody who wasn't there by nature. They weren't there originally. But the Lord is able to graft them in. Is it beyond the Lord then to restore Israel to himself? 
No, if he could graft in the wild branches, he could certainly bring again those who were originally in it. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either, you Gentiles. Don't be haughty. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And then he says in verse 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my, command, my covenant sorry, with them when I take away their sins. Now, isn't this amazing <laughs> that he says here, not only is he going to save the Gentiles, but he's going to provoke Israel to jealousy. Israel's going to look one day and say, you know, all these years, the Gentiles have been coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus is Lord. They're saying he's God. And they've been calling out to him the mercy and they've been receiving the gift of eternal life. They've been brought into all these blessings that the Old Testament, the Tanakh as the Jews would call it, what it speaks about. They've been brought in. And one day as a nation, what's left of the nation, because this will be at the end of the tribulation period, when there's but a small remnant of them, as described in Zechariah 12, and they're there in Jerusalem, and the nations are surrounding them, ready to wipe them out, ready to take care of the Middle East question once and for all. And at that moment, Zechariah 12 says, they're going to look on me whom they pierced, and they're going to mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Try reading Isaiah 53 from the shoes of the restored remnant of the future. Try reading it from the sandals of a Jew who sees, I've been all wrong about Jesus. He is the Christ. He is Messiah. He is Lord. And they cry out to him for salvation. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And they're going to say, you died for me, like we sing today, wounded for me, wounded for me, there on the cross he was wounded for me, dying for me, dying for me, there on the cross he was dying for me. They're going to say that. It was for us he was pierced. He did all that for us. And they're going to look up and their redemption is going to draw nigh as the Lord comes to save them. Now that reminds me, and it could just be an overactive imagination, but I don't think so. It reminds me of Ruth chapter 4, where you see the Gentile being brought in, Ruth being brought into the congregation, and the elders and the women commending her and saying, may God do with you what he's done with our great ancestresses. May you become part of the genealogy. And they didn't know it, but the genealogy that would eventually culminate in King David, one of their greatest heroes, and beyond King David, with his greater descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gentile brought in. Ruth brought in as much as anybody could be brought in. You don't get any more brought in than that, right? And what happens when Ruth is brought in? Well, let's close by looking at Ruth 4 one more time. Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4. And we read in Ruth chapter 4, verse 14, Ruth 4, 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, a kinsman redeemer. May his name be famous in Israel, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Now they give her this wonderful benediction, and you contrast this with how we first see her coming back to Bethlehem in chapter 1. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Don't call me Naomi, my pleasantness. Call me Mara. And we can go through times in our lives where we think, 
all is lost. This is such a heavy trial. This is such a hard thing. This is so grievous to bear. Why has the Lord done this? And we can't see the end the Lord has in view. That he says, I'm going to give you someone who's going to restore you, Naomi. Someone who's going to nourish you, care for you. You won't have to worry about famine again. One who's going to restore what was lost. One who's actually going to link you in with bigger and better blessing than you ever had. You lost two sons, that's tragic. But I gave you Ruth, who's better to you than seven sons. What a testimony. And through that Gentile, Ruth comes back to where she ought to be, and she's brought into more than she ever had before. And again, I say linked to a genealogy that the book ends with, that connects her to David, and we know from the New Testament, that connects her to Christ. And you say, how much more could one receive? Is there any greater fullness than what God gives Naomi, and what God gives Ruth, and what God does for the nation, for that matter? And it's a picture of what he's going to do in the future with the Jewish people, when they, in a remnant, come to the Lord and believe on him. And not only them, but Zechariah says, in that day many peoples shall be added to the Lord. So many nations, all nations flowing up to Jerusalem, as Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 tell us, and saying, come, let us learn of the Lord. This is the great work of our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what our Father, our God in heaven, who has done through him. 